This audio podcast is available on YouTube, iTunes and Google Play. Or you can download and listen to an MP3 audio file from my website or add the RSS feed to your podcast player. If you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, I would appreciate a rating and a review. And on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell icon. If you enjoy an episode, a like is always welcome, as are any comments or questions you may have, which you can add in the comment section below each episode. Thank you. Cheers. Although, uh, if, if people don't like, they're going straight down into David Jones's locker, so they better click the like button. And welcome to the Sim Racing Perspectives podcast for Sunday, the 21st of October 2018. I'm delighted to have Sean Cole on the show. Welcome, Sean. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Sean, thank you very much for joining. Um, I don't even know where to start with you because I've been watching your content for so long. Um, and you're like, you're kind of. I see you as kind of synonymous with same racing. If you think of same racing, you think of, of Sean Cole. Now I want to, like I do with everybody on the show, I want to go back to the beginning, if I may. So um, um, now, if I remember correctly, you started was was it was it same racing tonight with Darren Ganji? And did you start? Yeah. Did you guys start before even YouTube started, or how did it how did it actually happen? And uh, where where did you get into same racing? I know like. You've talked with Billy, for example, and, and, and Billy was doing the sprint cars with, with his with his with his dad. And so how did you get into sim racing, um, motorsport in general? And, and how did it all start back in the day, shall we say, with Darren? OK, uh, you have a very good memory, by the way. Very few people remember the original original was actually sim racing tonight. That was the very first show. <laughs> it was. Yeah, um, I remember, yeah. And to answer your first question or complete that answer, uh, I think YouTube actually existed, but YouTube had a very strict limit on file size, length of video, and resolution. And we did a different place. I think it was called Stage 6 uh, that used DivX, if I'm not mistaken. This is going back 10 years. So, uh, But uh, they actually allowed what was considered high resolution at the time maybe 480 maybe 360 i can't remember wow yeah. uh and and videos that were 30 or 40 minutes long so that's where our original launch was done until youtube came around and then when they went high resolution and 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 full length then it was easy to switch to that um so that that's that part of the answer the other uh, question you would ask is how i kind of got into this in general into sim racing i guess in general um and and I guess that really just goes back to, you know, partly my age. I mean, not to date myself horribly, but when I was a child and went to the video arcade, there weren't video games. You know, I was I was a kid when Space Invaders came out. Mm -hmm. So um, was I, by the so, way. So <laughs> we not to talk numbers, but I know what you mean. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I literally remember playing nickel games where you operate a mechanical bat to hit a, a a marble essentially to play a baseball i i want to say video game but there was no video aspect to it it was a mechanical operated game um and that sounds really old now <laughs> um but but as soon as games started having wheels and pedals uh, you know and i i can't remember the name right now but there's like a, a eight player was one of the first ones i really remember that really took off but it was like an eight player, two guys, you know, uh, facing in each direction inward. Yeah. So you had two by two by two and you raced at the same time in the arcades. And I just went nutso for that. And, and even like spy, the uh, spy chaser, what was the game called? I can't remember some of the originals, uh, night rider, uh, or night racer, where it was literally just two dots and you, the car wasn't even being, uh, uh, part of the video. It was like, a a. a a vinyl graphic over the glass. So it was just always centered, you know, anyway, I just, I always, from day one, I just gravitated towards racing games and I've always liked cars. And anyway, so I, I just, 
growing up with the first computers, uh, the home, you know, all the, the original Atari 2600, all that, you know, I just racing games. They were the ones that I liked and I have just evolved with it since then, you know? Yeah. Like I, I'm thinking now, like, um, like the, the Atari 2600 and the Commodore and the first Mac and indeed Steve Jobs, I believe, got his first job with Atari, wasn't it? So writing a game, and I believe he got was actually to do to do most of the coding. And then, Sean, uh, did you then once like once consoles and stuff came around, did you start with um, with PlayStation? Did you start with 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 Gran Turismo, or how did you actually like? Were, were you were you continuously playing, or how did it go? Uh, that's actually a really great question. Um. I gravitated at the PC as soon as it could be done that way. Um, so going back in time, the very, very first Thrustmaster Wheels T1, uh, I remember distinctly playing before there were even wheels, so just using a G joystick or even the, the old uh, red button, you know, uh, uh, original PC joystick. Yeah. Um, I always had a console in my life, but as soon as I could do it on the PC and it started... There, there, as soon as there was any separation, which happened very early on, if you think about it, but very early on, the PC software was more powerful, more serious than the console when it came to racing games. So, um, but I think I've maintained both. But then when you think to like the first generations of uh, uh, Gran Turismo, I owned it, but it wasn't a really big deal in my life. A friend of mine had to talk me into getting an Xbox and convinced me that I had to be playing Project Gotham. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I don't remember exact dates. This was like, I think this was even before NASCAR 2003. So it would have been the previous version of Papyrus NASCAR, uh, maybe going back as far as time as sports car GT from the guys who are now R factor. Uh, so this is like right before, the explosion of sim in my mind it was just on the dawn of that era and you know i was dabbling with it but at that point the pc was already more sophisticated to me yeah and did you lean towards a, or were you pulled towards a particular type of racing genre or simulation like was it was it gt racing or indycar or did you i guess was it just anything basically as as long as it was racing a little bit of anything, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you know the, the driver Boris said, but like one of my favorite drivers is Boris said, and it's not because of any single accomplishment he had in his career, it's because it seemed like he was more concerned about having fun as a race car driver than it was winning championships or winning money. or I, and, yeah. and he managed to get himself in just about every discipline of racing there was here in North America. And I love that because I like driving anything. I mean, and I'm a fan of racing anything. So now that's just my overall feeling and concept of where I find myself even today. Uh, I did gravitate towards Papyrus and the NASCAR Sims, mm -hmm. not so much because of my love for NASCAR, uh, which I, I, I like NASCAR. I love NASCAR at the time. I even had season ticket holder, you know, seats at one point, but it, it was more that I'll, I'll race anything. So I was kind of looking for what felt like the most sim yes. at the time. And, and that's where I was gravitating towards. And it was like, well, I'll run whatever discipline this sim is best in. Cause that's what I'm wanting out of my sim. And at the same time, I was also doing a lot of flight sim stuff and I had the same oh, requirements really? on the flight. Line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting because there's still the Hotas gear, and I guess that the, we and I've talked about this on the show before the the Papyrus NASCAR 2003. The basis of that was basically became i racing, which you're of course still in, involved in, as are many people. And then Sean, you've perhaps spoken at this before, but how did you meet with Darren? How did this start then? Uh, uh, let me come back to one thing, and I'll answer yep. that question. Um, I'm, th I'm talking about Pyrus, and for those who really want to go back in time, like one of the biggest, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, one of the biggest moments in my sim racing life was when Project Wildfire came out for NASCAR 2003. And this led to what became the, the red line, ugh, my memory is so bad, red line mod, I believe. But 
This was when the GTP cars were introduced, and I, there were some Trans Am cars that came as well, were introduced to the Papyrus uh, physics, essentially. So they took NASCAR 2003 when, and what had always been an Oval Sim plus Watkins Glen and Sears Point. Yeah. Uh, now it had a, a huge variety of imported, like from GPL, uh, Grand Prix Legends type tracks, and the ability to race GTP cars, like the greatest era of racing ever to exist, uh, and and some Trans Am cars as well. And it's like that was when my sim racing world really went crazy because I'm like, now I can do everything. Now you know. It, it, anyway, that was a big th- yeah. big moment when that happened. Was that um, on licensed content, like modded by the community, or how did that go? Uh, don't quote me on this so i'm not trying to state fact i'm just kind of stating by my memory that's what you remember yeah yeah well and i remember i and there was an original problem so it came out as one way and then there were some legal issues and it had to be toned down quite a bit okay Uh, so, so i do remember the authentic i'll even say illegal but i don't think it was intentionally illegal let's say because it was resolved um, but still, it just showed what we could have one day. Potentially, yeah, basically, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, and essentially, it kind of stepped on the toes of what it did again, as you mentioned, become iRacing. So, and I, I, but that's just me by my memory. I could have some of my facts a little backward on that. So, just loosely use my wording on what happened back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, your qu- second or the next question was how did I come to meet Darren? Uh, we were racing in an endurance series. And as random as meeting other people and becoming teammates in an endurance league way back then, especially, uh, you know, you just randomly find yourself on a team. And then sometimes it'd be secondary that you'd be like, oh, wow, you live in Southern California. So do I, you know, because they could just as easily have lived in New York, Boston or, you know, Michigan or wherever. Yep. Um, But it turns out that my teammate and I live within, you know, 45 minute drive of each other. So we decided the next event that I'd go over and his best friend or or good buddy uh, was also two of his good friends were on the team as well. And they're also local. So we actually had a whole endurance team, four drivers who are all driving out of the same location. We were we were this is back when you had to like disconnect and then reconnect and you'd lose a lap or two because uh, the, the reconnecting time. It was, you know, you basically have to pull into the pits back in the day yeah, and then pull your internet cord was the fast way to do it instead of exit. Someone eventually made a program where you could like hit alt tab or something and it would kill it. But Oh God, it uh, sounds like a nightmare. They, <laughs> oh, it was so screwy. It was so weird. Yeah. It was like, there was like an instant crash, uh, 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 app kind of thing. We call them maps now. Uh, but, uh, uh, that you could kill just NASCAR kill. I think it was called. Anyway, uh, we didn't have to do that because, and, and you know, you you didn't have to do driver changes. I think it was more like, well, you're doing a 24 hour event. No one man's going to do it. So we were able to just literally pull in and just adjust the seat and continue on. So yeah, uh, doing an endurance, uh, a handful of races, and then doing one in person is how we met. From there, just to catch you from that moment, what led to SRT, which yeah. I, uh, you know. Uh, from there, we started hosting our own series and doing live broadcasts. We weren't even on camera. It was just typical broadcasts. So we had a camera guy, two guys on the microphone, and somebody producing the stream, so to speak. Mm. Uh, and then we, and then from there, I think we started recording some intros. So it's like one thing kind of led to another. It was racing. Then we're hosting a series, but we wanted it to be one of the best series out there. So we're streaming it. And and again, this is before streaming even really existed. Yeah. Um, that is before streaming was officially like what it is today. And te- sure. Indeed, before it was technically possible. Yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of workarounds to make it happen. And it was very clunky because you just couldn't do what we do today. Um, anyway, f- from there, I don't know. It was just happened yeah yeah and then i don't know we were just kind of kidding around in a weird way like oh well what if we made a tribute show to sim racing right that's kind of where srt begun began 
was just, okay, what if we did a tribute to sim racing? And we sort of just joked around and structured a show and then we decided to film it. And then it went over like way better than we imagined. <laughs> and so we kind of, I, I, and so, I mean, and we already had considered maybe episode two, but I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what we were getting into. That's, that's safe to say. It was just one more step in what we had been doing. And then it kind of just took off. We're just winging it, basically. And Sean, can I ask back to the NASCAR and pulling into the pits and pulling out your internet connection so you wouldn't uh, lose a position or whatever. Were you doing Were you doing 24-hour endurance races back then? Yes, yes, we were. What year was this? When was this you were doing this? Then? 24 this had, hours. This had to have been as far back as like 2004, 2005. Really? Yeah, wow. it was again. It was clunky. What you had to do is there was it was a total workaround. So going back to the day where you'd be in a hosted room because that's all there really was, and you would show up. You you'd change your player file name to be you know Team SRT. Let's just say, and every driver would then have to copy that exact player file, so that their machine would essentially think that it was the same guy. So I would pull into the pits and I would intentionally disconnect from the room, just like, which happens. And, it, and to this day, that does happen. And to this day, you can still rejoin in most Sims. Well, as long as the next guy who rejoins has the exact player file name, and it's not actually me, it wasn't checking IP addresses, well, he could join and the game would think it was just me rejoining. You'd lose the lap or two because it takes a while to reconnect. And boom, he starts driving as the same guy. So it was it was a total workaround, but we'd pull it off. It was really uh but it was it, it was really fun even way back then. It's only gotten better now. Yeah, and we've come a long way in fifteen or sixteen years. And I mm -hmm. guess basically in a way what you're saying for both setting up multiplayer races and making videos it was all a case of well we know what we want we know what we want to do we just have to figure out a way to do it yep yep and then then you met uh how did jessica lopez come into the show then you had i know i know you you had a great video where you hooked up with jessica recently so how did that start then um again everything was just one thing built on another uh, yeah, we, we'd done a, a handful of shows at that point. Not a lot, really. I mean, we had only done, again, I can't remember exact numbers, but, you know, five to 10 shows, I think, at which point we were like, okay, well, we're going to keep this going. This is fun. We had the time. Coincidentally, it was giving us an instant reward uh, as far as in the community goes. Mm. And yes. Which is very important. Mm. Yeah. And and I think also one thing to keep in mind is that we are always mimicking like ESPN, Speed Center, whatever you want to say. And it was like, okay, well, what if we had a, a, a pretty girl, you know, uh, helping present? And it was like, well, how would that go over? So we put an ad in the paper and we got a, a handful of people but really one of the first people we met was jessica and she knew nothing about sim racing but was like totally curious totally and it's not like we were offering a bunch of money or either so it's like her curiosity no, no, had no. to be genuine because it was like yes hey, there was here. no point otherwise yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and then you know we're just this like uh you know we're a internet show that meant nothing um yeah. at the time so she really, really was curious. She liked the idea. She was looking to go somewhere in broadcasting. So this was a cool way to at least start like practicing and going through the motions. And so she gave it a try. We gave it a try. And it was, it was actually just a magical fit. Um, you know, she was really perfect for it. She really started learning it and she she did some driving here and there but you know we never turned her into a sim racer but she really embraced what we did and when she saw it from the perspective of our eyes and the show's eyes she was like wow this is you know as sophisticated 
and as planned, not just the show, but sim racing itself and coordinated and like real competition. And I think it was a little eye opening for her that people could take it so seriously to the point that it could resemble anything else that you'd mirror it to, you know, bike racing, golf, whatever you want to make the leap or comparison to. It wasn't just games, you know. There was more to it than that. Yeah. I remember Jessica being on the show and, and the, the time she left. And yeah, funny, funny. Nice to think back on those times because a lot has changed since then. Now, Sean, up uh, onto what you're doing now and, uh, and the Sim Pit and the Sim Pit crew, which is great. Um, you've, you've made re reference to stuff you're doing on the side. If I might ask, are you hosting sim racing events or... If you if you want to talk about that side other than what you do on YouTube, you kind of you've seen to be a, around in in a lot of kind of avenues. So is there something that you do in terms of prom promotional at events, or how does it go? Um, it's it's kind of hard to answer that question because it changes all the time. You know, the Sim Pit, I put out shows, I do my live streams. I started a patron group uh, a while back, and that kind of created a whole new community and environment and with that we've been just kind of playing with and doing other things so i mean like right yeah. now i'm associated with or running in three four five different series it's hard to keep up with but you know there's a, a sim pit series that runs on sim racing systems using a yes. corsa and that runs thursday and friday nights um we have a race room series on SRS that runs on Saturdays. We are currently uh, hosting a truck series on iRacing that runs Friday nights. We are hosting a Mazda MX-5 series on iRacing that's running Sundays at noon. In addition to that, like I said, this, this patron support group is the best way to put it. I mean, there are people who are really fans of and supporting the show. But yeah, which just, is great, yeah. Yeah, but we, we hang out on Discord each and every day. There are guys who just help out with people. We set up spontaneous things. I mean, like yesterday we played Wreckfest and had like 20 of us playing Wreckfest together, all on chat together. So it's sort of taken on its own life, and it's sort of uh, uh, separate from, but part very much integral and part of the Sim Pit. Uh, it's also allowed me to do things like live stream certain things that I would never have done, like just unboxing a, a, a rig or putting it together or, you know, just that kind of open video type thing. So all of that directly associated with the Sim Pit is, if that answers your question, outside of the Sim Pit, I'm doing very little now. Um, I've, you know, in, in getting the sim pit going, you know, I, I had some side jobs that I would do that had nothing to do with sim. Yeah, exactly. All. That's what I, that's what I was referring to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky to get a, uh, engineering job and I used the word, I, I threw up air quotes. You can't see them. But when I said engineering, yeah. uh, my job title was quality assurance engineer. And again, I use air quotes. It basically meant that I knew how to read a uh, micrometer uh, and I knew how to use a measuring stick and a camera and, and log data on a spreadsheet accurately. I guess people go to college for that sort of thing. <laughs> to me, it was sort of like, that's all you need me to do? No problem. Um, yeah. And it was, it was really nice because it was very on and off work. It didn't happen a lot, uh, which was great because it left me a lot of free time and it paid me I unfairly um for what it was and what I was doing but it would because of the importance of the work and what it saved the company by having me do it versus the person who was doing it before me it worked out really well for both parties so that actually helped really finance the launch of the sim pit because you know you know from what you're doing these things take a lot of time I mean I put oh, six indeed. hours a week mm -hmm. Easily, I put 60 hours, probably more like 70 or 80, but I put endless time into what I do, and it, it doesn't necessarily pay you for that time. So No, no, it doesn't, no. Um, that was always nice. I've also, uh, now this is, is sim racing related, I've also worked on and off in various different capacities, and this goes back nine years with CXE simulations. 
we met Chris Constantine of CXC. He was the first industry person that Darren and I met when we started Sim Racing Tonight. So when we just started getting going, he is the first person we physically met in the industry. We were like, hey, you're in yeah. the same town as us. Can we come check out your stuff? Um, and honestly, that was back when we were still trying to launch that show. And Chris was like, hey, I don't suppose you guys would be interested in building Sims. And I was like, I will. Um, and so I was yeah. doing that on the Sign side. Me up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So I did that on and off at various different points. And uh, and then until this year, even, I was working. Tra uh, when I came back to Los Angeles, they hired me as a special projects guy. So I was help building their next gen sim. I was help doing like converting a NASCAR from a NASCAR to a sim. Um, there's a formula one project. I actually didn't work on that one, but, uh, they were converting that one. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do some of those special project stuff. And then I started working trade shows with them as they started getting out, doing various different, uh, trade shows. So I did that for a couple of years and in the last 12 months, I've been just really focused the, the quality assurance engineer air quotes. Uh, job has kind of dried up and the CXC trade shows take me away for too long. Like I can't do it simultaneous. It's not like a part-time job. It's like here, disappear for 10 days. So, so no, now I'm full, you know, now I'm, you know, just simp hit only and have been that way for a little bit. Yeah. Which is great because YouTube is like that basically. And even in terms of the algorithm and. You know, if you're not creating content regularly, it's kind of difficult to kind of maintain a presence. And back then, when you when you guys, you yourself and Darren first met CXC, what were they building back then? Now we have a whole host of software titles and advanced things now, and CXC are doing this motion motion simulator rigs. But what were they building back then? Or it was actually very similar to what they produced today uh, a, oh. a much a much much less refined version of so it was using a much lesser wheel uh this was before anybody made a direct drive wheel uh yeah they were using canon cst pedals if anybody remembers those but you know canon got us into load cell high-end pedals you know a good decade ago so they're using those pedals and they're using a, a conversion of a frex to post simulator, which is really kind of the heart of a lot of motion sims to this day. Uh, they've all gotten bigger and beefier and faster and smoother and all that, but it's essentially the same. And how much was yeah. it when you, sorry, when you and Darren first experienced that, it must have been a serious eye opener. And how much was the setup from CXC back then? It must have been huge money. Indeed, it is now, but. I think it was 35 to 40 grand at the time, maybe 38 ish. Um, you know, it already was to the point that it had triple screens. The fit, the chassis was very similar in looks to what it is today. It's just a lot more refined. Like I said, uh, yeah. a little bigger, beefier, the, the motion systems much evolved, but it's the same principle. Yes. Uh, and now I think they're up to like $75,000. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. The reason we met him wasn't, the motion sim i mean that was part of it but at the time he was one of the first people selling an sli type display so very similar to the sli type display that is still sold today in a sandwich plate that would work on a logitech g25 so you just unbolted the wheel slid the little plate in and it held this the sli plate right above uh the center hub of the wheel between that and the the wheel rim. And it was one of the original, like you could buy the SLI on its own, but it was sort of like, well, where do I put this thing? You know, it didn't come with a box or anything. It was just like the three displays on a board or you could buy the CXC version. So that was how we met him as he was actually selling those to sim racers. Whereas the $35,000 motion sim wasn't necessarily for sim racers. It was for rich people. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. And I didn't realize, I mean, that technology has been around a lot longer. I know that, I mean, for aircraft simulations and so on, and for Formula One teams, 
they've had proprietary systems for for a long time but i hadn't realized the companies like cxc were actually that old that's interesting yeah, well, I mean, if you go way back in time, there are a handful of companies that were out there. I don't know if you remember the company like Thomas Superwheel, but no, before force feedback was reliable. And when I say that, you know, going back in time, so this would be, you know, NASCAR 2003 era, or, or even a little before that, this would have been even like 98. But, you know, you could get a Logitech wheel. The Red Momo, for example, is a beloved wheel by many. And it was one of the first force feedback wheels that were pretty good. And I'd break one of those every month. I was league racing at the time already playing Grand Prix Legends, I think, and whatever the previous version of, uh, and I, I break that wheel every month. And I had a whole stack of broken ones in my closet and that was getting a little costly and force feedback was a little weird. Um, there's the, uh, something RS wheel. It was another brand. It was like kind of the first high-end plastic force feedback wheel. And it lasted longer than the Logitech wheel would, but it was like really slow. It was like 900 degrees, which at the time was like, oh, wow, 900 degrees. Um, and they had an H-pattern shifter at the time. And, wow. yeah. um, but I found that wheel to be really slow. Anyway, then there's Thomas Superwheel. They still didn't believe in force feedback. So they'd use an old school spring wheel, but it was super heavy duty ball bearings, Momo wheel rims. I mean, you could easily, I spent a thousand dollars getting a Thomas super wheel before we even thought force feedback was cool. So it was out there. It was just kind of hard to find back in the yes. day. And again, we've come a long way in 15 or 16 years with oh, yeah. all the content you can get. Now you can just go down to your local target or Walmart, whatever, and, by a force, fee, force feedback wheel, sorry, and, and there you go. Um, I remember, I remember when the Simpit started. You had a guy on. You sometimes had him on, but I haven't seen him since. Was he an older guy? Uh, yes, an older guy. Was it John Hill? It must have been. Yeah. Was his segment called Over the Hill? It must be John Hill that I'm thinking of. Yeah. I'm gonna do some research simultaneously. So John Hill uh, has always. Uh, been like a, a background advisor and supporter of the show in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and he did his show called Over the Hill, which was just, it was always sort of like a That's right. completely mm -hmm. different perspective of sim racing than, than I would have for say, for example. So, so he's, he's actually got a comeback piece coming uh, fairly soon. Now that you bring him up. Okay. Uh, so no, it's just sort of like, you know, when he had something to say, he'd come out. And I gave him a forum for having a slightly different opinion than I on a lot of things. Um, and that... Which is which is a good thing, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's kind of one of the things that I've been playing with and doing on the Simpit is trying to, you know, we created the Simpit Crew channel, a second channel on YouTube, so that I could mm. have a place for other people to stream as well. Like, uh, you know, and, and I use that word stream very loosely because on that channel, it could even be more than streaming. Now, I've had two people do streaming videos. I haven't any, had anyone do any like full edited, but uh, one of the streamers is going to switch to like edited content. Um, it's just sort of where I'm leaving like uh, the room open for other people to be involved. Um, you know, I, I that was one thing with the sim pit is, you know, I, I don't know my even the way I do my intro from the very beginning. It's like I know I'm the host of the show, but I really hope that anything and everything else I talk about or do is far more important than I am, uh, whether it be who I'm racing with or whether it be the product I'm reviewing. But it's like, yeah, we only know me because I'm there every time. But it's really about you know, the next level racing stand or the R seat stand or the Bodner wheel or the Thrustmaster wheel, you know, those, those, I, I, I try to really keep it that way. And, and again, getting back to like our patron program and, and having all these other people involved in the show, you know, I want there to be a forum for them to, to get out there and get exposure as well. So, so that's something we kind of, I look at it as being very open, um, Yes. I don't have very much structure to the sim pit. It's I've just kind of been like, you know what? It's going to be a combination of what I think is good for the community, what's good for me, what's fun for me, also what's 
in the best interest of the sim pit in terms of growth as well. But those other factors were more important than, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to be clickbait or I'm not going to, you know, it's like, I didn't want to use any, like, I'm not going to over promote to the point where people are like, well, he shut up about his show, you know? And, and I know those are like the new methods of the internet, but I'm like, kind of like, you know, I want it to be organic you know, and, and I've been really strict about maintaining that since the beginning of the sim pit. Um, you know, that's been a big part of it. But my impression is first and foremost, it's about the passion for sim racing, which you and your community have, and it's about the community and it's about sharing knowledge and getting involved in racing. And that's the, and which is how I, I think you're doing it the right way, Sean. Thank you. That's the thing. You're welcome. Now, um, uh, something I noted actually, and it's something that came up in the some previous episodes where we were talking about Simi Cube. You, in one of your videos, when I was looking for a reference to John's name, I saw this. Um, was it Wave Italy or something like pedals? And then there's Huskenveld in in uh, in the in the Netherlands. And I realized that there seems to be several, like especially in Europe, kind of boutique manufacturers making high end. Um, sim racing gear it's just something a side note I wanted to ask you about because I thought you might have, might have some knowledge on this there seems to be several companies small manufacturing companies making high end either pedals or rims or like there's a ecosystem of companies su surviving on I guess I mean they're selling to professional teams and to enthusiasts and so on so uh, have you a window into into how that market is, Sean, or? Uh, you know, it's not huge in terms of, you know, you might be the only guy in your town to be on a set of high-end pedals. But yeah. when you multiply that on a global scale, and, you know, we're in such a global world at this point that unless, you know, for the most part, most Western cultures, let's just say, it's pretty easy to get these products out of Europe to, you know, most of the countries that we, we deal with regularly. Now, I've heard some nightmare stories about South America uh, and, and even like Canada sometimes, but you know, for the most part, we've become a global world and you can pretty much get these products anywhere. And so when you're talking about as many sim racers who take it as seriously as it's becoming, I wanna say become, but it's still getting more serious. I don't know if our growth is as fast as how many people are con being converted to the serious side of sim racing. Um, and I think that's where the big change is. And I think for a lot of people, you know, maybe it even goes back to what I was saying back in the day. It's like, well, you know, I know the pedals on all the commercial wheels. I just, that's what I call them at this point, Logic, Thrustmaster, Fanatic. Yeah, they, they work great. Um, club sport pedals are fantastic. But I mean, like the, the, the stock pedals, they're fine, but if you're going to do this every day, a thousand dollars isn't that much. You know, I just bought a new bicycle trying to get back into bike, you know, just riding. I used to race, but now I'm just trying to get back into riding. And I was in shock. I mean, the sticker shock of the bike industry, like a good entry level race bike, like starts at like three grand. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And that's just the bike. You still need pedals. You still need shoes. You still need a helmet, gloves, a suit. You know, um, so when I look at this on a hobby scale, and if you do this Monday through Friday, so to speak, or every day or whatever, you're on the weekend, every weekend, it's really cheap. Um, even $1,000 for a pedal set. Because if you spend a grand on a yeah. set of Wave Italy's or Hussingfeld's or uh, Rick Motek or, you know, the list goes on HPP, you know, th they're going to last you five, 10 years, you know, there, there's no reason that you're going to have a problem with any of those brand of pedal, any of those high end pedals. You know, my uncle's an avid golfer. I used to be, but my uncle still is. And it's like, he'll drop 500 bucks on a driver that he might despise in a month and he'll buy another one. You know, he, I, I think that that's why there's been a big thing, you know, with, with I racing, you got to give them credit where credit is due. And I don't want to get in a, which sim is best or, you know, I'll certainly give you my opinion, but that's not, I'm not here trying to stoke the argument, but I racing has created a real ranking system, a real ladder system that has inspired the serious sim racers. Um, 
So if you look at that crowd in particular, I think you'll find a lot of high-end component users just because they're real hobbyists of our sport, our hobby. You know, our, I, I always, in my intro, I always have a, even knowing what to call what we do at this point. It's so much more than just a hobby, um, but it is a hobby. It is so it's 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 a sport on certain levels, sure. I, I kind of call it the only real true esport. <laughs> but uh I know what you mean, yeah. You know, and, and so yeah, I think if you take it seriously that there's that's not too much money. And that mindset I think creates a pretty good market for those people. Are they gonna become millionaires? No. But they can certainly have a company and make some decent amount of money, expand their lineup, make some more money. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I think the main thing, like a lot of careers or a lot of small companies, you know, maybe you don't make a fortune, but it keeps you in the lifestyle that you want to live. So again, I'll go back to my bicycle life. I remember the manager of the bike shop or the owner of the bike shop I used to manage. And I made more money than he did as the manager than he did as the owner but you know he got to go to every trade show for the bike industry he got to get the visits from the pros when trek would send him down he got access to the races and the special events that he wanted to because cycling was his life and i think for a lot of these people who make components again maybe they're not getting rich but they are rich in their life. If you're, you know, Nails Huskenfeld, yes. Huskenfeld, you know, he's been into, you know, the sim room of a handful of F3, F1 teams even. A lot of us would pay money to do that. It's become part of his lifestyle. And Sean, you were at the, I remember you did videos of the, the Visa Vegas event and you were there in person, I believe. And then you had, um, and this will lead directly into the, the pit stop show that you're doing on a regular basis now. From the, following the Visa Vegas, you had the um, McLaren uh, World's Fastest Gamer. And I, I think you were one of the first people to interview Rudy Van Buren. I remember you had Ru- Rudy on the show, yeah. which was very interesting at the time. Yeah, I don't know how I've been so lucky to uh, meet people before, like right before their name becomes huge. Like it was just random kind of luck, just certain people I know that, enabled me to meet Rudy in advance of what was going on. Um, and then to have him be the winner, it was like, hey, what a stroke of luck that was. Um, I've been real lucky about that, but I think part of it is that I, you know, I, 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 I've met a lot of great people and a lot of these people are always looking out for the sim pit also and saying, hey, you know what? This guy's going to turn heads. You got to talk to him. Um, I met Glenn McGee before he won the whole Mazda thing, you know, but it was like, I could have interviewed any of the people in it, but it was somehow Glenn and I are the ones who talked, became really good friends. He wins the thing. And to this day, me and Glenn McGee stay in touch and see when we can combine efforts and, you know, in things. So. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me between that and then like going to Visa Vegas and getting to meet, I mean, really, the who's who of the alien leaderboard of sim racing was were at Vegas. Yeah. I mean, all of them, <laughs> all of them were there. You know, yeah, it, Bono was there, and yeah, yeah. Mm. Enzo Benito, Ollie Pacla, Graham Carroll, Patrick Holzman. Um, I'm leaving out ten other guys. Um, meeting some of the heads of state when we talk about positioning in the industry. Well, like Alex Simpson was there. Dom Dewan was there. Um, I've just been very lucky over the years and this dates back to even when, you know, you talk about sim racing tonight or inside sim racing, um, the same thing. I mean, I think just that, I guess you could say I've been doing this a long time. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the impression I've got anyway. Yeah. Yes. So, so over the years, I've just been lucky to meet a lot of people and make some really good relationships and. You know, sim racing, like I said, it is a hobby. It's an industry, which means a lot of the people that I've known even before the shows, you know, uh, you know, we, when I talk about the broadcasting that Darren and I were doing before SRT, uh, it was a, it was called, it, it was called the flog series. And 
you know, I think of some of the people who were involved way back then, but it's like all of Redline was there. Dom Dewan was racing in the series. Gregor Hutu was racing in the series. Um, uh, uh, and a handful of other, to this day, known top drivers, you know, were guys who were top drivers going all the way back to like 2000, 2004 in that era. Um, yeah, wow. That, you know, and when people realize, you know, people are like, oh, is Gregor still have it? You know, because Martin Cronkies, you know, beat him a few times in a row. And it's like, I don't know if people realize how long Gregor Futu has been the best driver in sim racing. Because it goes so far before uh, iRacing. And, you know, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it blows my mind how long Gregor Futu has been the best. Yeah. And now you'd still have to say he's one of the best. I don't know if you could say he's the best today. Uh, Bono, who we seems pretty amazing i think we got lucky with brendan lee lay as well um with f1 2018 just another you know i don't know it's weird it's great he's a great friend of the show as well so i'm always pulling for him and yeah, which yeah. is which is great to have yeah yeah but what's what's really awesome though is that brendan you know he won last year f1 2017 i guess we could call it and he was up against the heads of state of that sim. But when the F1 2018 draft came along, look who was there. It was basically the same guys who were all at Visa Vegas. Every guy at Visa Vegas was at the F1 2018 draft, essentially. And that's who Brendan got the upper hand on in round one, or at least race one, two, and three. So it's great to see that he is the man when it comes to F1 2018. That's his world. That's at his least, wheelhouse, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. At least for now, we'll see. I'm sure they'll they'll get they'll catch him. So basically, in a way, Gregor Hutu was a sim racing alien even before i racing was a thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a. Yeah. I did a, a a spoof video before uh, SRT even, and it was a alien interview, and it was because he was the uh, Gregor Hutu was the first person I can remember ever being called an alien. Uh, like, like if people know that term or use the word alien or talk about the aliens in the room or the aliens in their series or, or racing sim, yeah. Gregor Hutu is the first person. I'm not saying that we invented the word alien for those guys who are just better than us, but he's the first person in sim racing I can ever think of being thought of or, or stated as an alien. And Gregor's now working on the UI for R Factor 2, I believe. You know, he gets his hands on a lot of things behind the scenes. Um, you know, he's, yeah. he's a pretty private individual, so it's hard to get a word with Gregor. Um, yeah, I got that impression, yeah. But he, he, you know, he's if you want an opinion, you need somebody's seal of approval or stamp of approval. You know, Gregor's the one. Gregor's the one to ask. And the... You were, like I said, you um, interviewed Rudy and then a f a first and a second time after he won. And then the World Fastest Gamer with McLaren was arranged by uh, Darren Cox's company. Darren had been behind the original Nissan Nismo um, LMP1 project. And now McLaren are running this McLaren Shadow, um, which I don't know. I think Rudy's going to compete. I don't know if he's going to be a finalist, but I think at least he's... He said on some of his streams that he's going to submit some times, but and something I referred to in the or something I noticed in this McLaren Shadow, they were also including mobile games or something. So there was like there was like R Factor Two, and Xbox, and then also mobile. So, um, are you up to date on the details of that? Because I haven't really been following it, Sean. I I, I might know just very slightly more than you but no i have the same impression and and you know for you know we haven't talked yet about the pit stop but you know with the pit stop i have my daily news and something that i've been covering yes. for over a year now um and i really saw my first taste of it i think at visa vegas and it kind of dawned on me that Wow, we've all been in this sim racing world, and depending on how long people have been doing it, you know, you could easily. There are a lot of people who could sit there and say, "I've been sim racing for twenty years," and I would never argue that with anybody. That's about when I think it all went from gaming to kind of sim racing, if you just loosely using words to describe our era. Yes, but uh, 
And I'm at Vegas and I'm thinking, uh oh, we've owned this hobby. We've influenced every turn this hobby has taken because it's always been so community driven. And I'm not talking Gran Turismo. I'm not talking Project Gotham or, or you know, uh, uh, Forza. I, I'm talking The Sims, you know, R Factor, iRacing. You can throw in some uh, Sim Bin back in the day. Um, but I think that the community influenced those games as much as the games influenced the community. And it's what has always kept it as sort of a cultish type hobby when you get, when you started using or throwing around the word sim. And when I met Visa Vegas and I'm looking at the people running it and I'm like, none of you are sim racing heads of state of any kind. And I'm looking at the amount of money and coverage and where it's being presented. And I'm like, Oh wow. So we've been begging for legitimacy for 20 years we've been, mm, you know, we, we've been begging to be considered a real part of the gaming industry a real part of motorsport we've been begging for any attention and proper recognition for 20 years and as soon as the world's going to love us they're going to ignore what made it and i'm not saying that's good or bad i just recognize that we are at a really important time in sim racing right now and and it's already happened but now we're starting to see what has happened. But yeah, they're having a mobile platform entry into McLaren Shadow, getting back to what you said. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying if you're trying to create and find the next Gregor Hutu, if you're having a sim racing competition, that's not right. Uh, you know, I mean, no. I'm sorry. To, I, no. I try. I try to I try to not sound elitist. You know, that's one of the things about Simber Pit is that I, I, I try to embrace everything about what we do all the way down to the lowest level of motorsport gaming there is. But I also am not afraid to create lines in the sand of where I think certain boundaries are. Um yeah. when I look at the top esport, well, it's not R Factor, Asceno Course, or iRacing. The biggest esport is F1 2018 or Forza, yeah. Gran Turismo. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, you know, most of those you can play with a controller and actually be really good. Um, now I appreciate that the pro rank of F1 2018, everyone's on the stage in a rig with a wheel, sim racing F1 2018. Um, but FIA is now involved. Um, I, oh gosh, we're, we're going to take this really long if I go this this direction. But go on. I uh, like a couple months ago, Germany, the German Motorsport Association. I don't recall their acronym, but they acknowledged sim racing as a true form of motorsport. Yeah, and I thought, oh, that's awesome. And then on the flip side, I heard the paranoid side of the argument, which is, no, that's terrible, because now they're going to regulate it. They're going to think they can regulate it. They're going to come in. They're going to start making and creating their own rule book for what we have already been doing. And I don't know if it's necessarily true to that level, but again, FIA is now involved in Codemasters F1 2018 championship. So... I out and Gran Turismo. Yeah. Hmm. You know, so th that's just kind of my fear, you know, and, and, and maybe it's just paranoid. It, it is paranoid too. It will have an influence that we didn't expect, I guess is really what I'm trying to say. I don't know if it's good or bad. It is good. You know what? It's money. People are being paid. Like, like this year, you're going to actually see professional sim racing. Like, like forget any other labeling of esport or whatever, but professional in that you're going to have somewhere between 10 and a hundred people this year living off of sim racing. Like they don't have another job. They are not looking for another job. They're a professional sim racer and, and maybe some are it's just a career. It's a career. And, and this is just the beginning. So that's awesome, but we're going to have to bow down to a new form of, of who's in charge. It's not going to be, 
Dave Kemmer of iRacing and charge. It's not going to be um, Marco Masaruto of Assetto Corsa. No, it's not. Um, it, it's going to be the FIA. It's going to be these cloud sport, cloud not, you know, these organizations that are bringing in millions of dollars are going to be in charge. And they're going to have things like, well, sure, we want to play on the Xbox or on PlayStation or even better on the cell phone because they're about marketing. They're about attention. They don't care about its roots. They don't care about its purity. They don't care about it as a sport. They don't care about it as a sport. They might put on a show, but they care about it as a marking opportunity. And, and if we were in charge, it would be about sport, right? Yeah. So mm. I don't know if I even, I don't even remember if we had a question or if I just turned that into a whole monologue. Sean, I get what you mean because you, and you said the keyword marketing. I mean, end of the day, motorsport needs as much exposure as it can get now. I mean, many people have said that the younger people now, the younger generation, maybe are not so much into cars and motorsport anymore so f1 and all yeah. the series they need as much exposure as possible so it's a numbers game and if the bulk of people who are playing a f1 simulation shall we call it are on the xbox or the playstation with a pad then that's where they are and if mclaren want exposure through the shadow program and that includes a mobile title then that's where they're going to go it doesn't mean that yeah when they pick the next Rudy Van Buren, the, the next um, professional sim racer, that person won't be qualifying on a, on a on an iPad. I'm I'm sure, but um, yeah, I th and I think for the serious positions, and I think there's a slight difference uh, from what I've heard. Like world's fastest gamer is what led to Rudy's job. Hmm. Uh, it's been unclear, but I don't think McLaren Shadow leads to being Rudy's replacement. It is a completely different context. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry, I wasn't aware. Yeah. So, but but and, and I could I'm a little fuzzy on the exact payout, but I had heard that it is not the same thing. Hmm. Um, even though the similarities are amazing, but it's 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 not engineered to be like round two of what we saw before. Yeah, that's a good point, and indeed, um. I watched a uh, run of Ru Rudy's streams one evening and somebody asked him what was happening and he said, well, I'm not, I'm not talking yet, but something. Uh, I got the impression there was was a opportunity for him to continue in the UK on some level, which is great. So, Yeah, and, and, and that was the other thing that when he, got, when he won that, I, I thought, you know, this is really cool because what Rudy does, how they use him and how he... They don't know what... I, and I think when he got the job, I really think... McLaren didn't a hundred percent know how they'd use him and what it would lead to. Yeah. But then they get, but then they get the perfect guy. Um, Absolutely. And, and then it's like, wow, it's turned into more than they imagined. I mean, see, I'm, I'm watching him drive a McLaren 720 at Coda um, doing hot laps for VIPs. Um, you know, this is yesterday, <laughs> you know, so it's obviously led to a lot more than just being a simulation guy for mclaren yeah and i think that's because not only did he win the opportunity he grabbed he continued to exceed expectations and turned it into more than anyone imagined he's become a brand ambassador if you will and uh yeah i think he drove so. at he drove at the goodwood festival of speed in the summer yes and in the m23 yeah and didn't he drive at suzuka as well or he yes, to yes, he, yeah, yeah. He's he's driving for real all the time, yeah, which on is McLaren's cool. Dime. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, I want to go back one thing we were just talking about. Yeah, um, I earlier had said sim sim racing was like the only true or real esport, mm. and I'm sure people are. I'm sure there's a handful of people rolling their eyes, like, "How dare you?" Yeah. Um, I want to come back to what we were just saying about. FIA and real life motorsport adopting sim racing finally after so many years getting involved in the push for the esport side of what we do and the link and the difference between us and all other esport is yes I'm sure the Call of Duty games I'm sure those do lead to more people enlisting into various different 
armies of whatever their nations are. But I don't think it's very direct. I think it's just these are people who like war games. Sure, oh, I want to be a soldier. Motorsport version of what we do, eSport, is a marketing opportunity for real life racing. If FIA, if Formula One is thinking of the future and how in a when when petro cars days seem to be numbered in our earth, let's just say. <laughs> yeah. How is Formula One going to stay relevant? Yeah. And how are they going to get new fans when every other form of racing is really starting to see a fall off in fanship? Yes. Um, and well, the computer is the answer because that's when I can actually market to a young crowd and make fans of motorsport. And that is where I see like why they want part of what we're doing. And I also see why, to me, it's also part of why I think of us being the truest form of eSport. Because our eSport literally can lead from, I win a championship in eSport version of racing. I'm given a real-life opportunity to drive. I perform and turn that into a multi-year contract being a professional race car driver. You know, we're going to see more and more of that scenario and that ladder system. Yeah. Meaning that we actually are directly attached to the sport that we are the E version of, let's just say. And I, and I don't see that for any other e-sport period. End of story. Um, you know. It's a good point you make because you have like, you have Dota and Starcraft and Overwatch and so on. And I mean, I'm interested in, in, other games and many games in general, as I believe you are too, Sean. And and they're kind of like sci-fi fantasy. They don't relate to the real world, but as you and you and it's a very good point. Sim racing can relate to the real yeah. world. And actually, something something that occurred to me the other day, and I wanted to perhaps make a video about it because my wife and I just bought a new car. It's a uh, it's one of those. Um, it's an automatic, but it's not true. An automatic it's a dual clutch system and uh, there may come the time when when i want to giant to drive a manual with the oncoming of electric and and hybrid and so on there may come a point where if i want to drive an old manual car and if i don't have one the only way i can do it is actually on the computer sure and those old cars you know i have an old car and uh, you know one of my secret fears is that at some point they will either make me jump through so many hoops or charge me so much money for me to actually put a mile on a public road in that car. Yes. Um, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm not trying to pass judgment on politics at all. I'm just, you know, and, and, and I suppose as the world gets more populated, it makes sense that we would become more efficient or we probably need to be, that would make sense. But it, it, it frightens the heck out of me. But yeah, we could, we're, I don't think we're all that far away, actually. I think within 10 years, we might be at the point where a civilian does not drive a combustion engine. And if it's electric, it doesn't need a transmission. Yeah. Um, and I think those days are numbered. Um, will it become illegal to drive the other? I don't know. But what if you have to drive 50 miles to get a gallon of gas? Um, and they, and you know, and they charge you ridiculous amount. It's like, well, how many, my car is a gas guzzler. So I, I can't even carry enough gas in fuel cans. And I'm certainly not going to drive the car 50 miles to go get that little bit of gas. Yeah. So at some point they could just make it ridiculously difficult. I mean, but that's also close on a whole industry. We're probably longer than 10 years away from such a thing, we but are. I do see the trend, you know, when I was, 15 years old, there was only one goal in my world and mind, and that was obtaining a driver's license and buying a car. That's it. That There was nothing else I cared about on planet Earth more. This is when I was 15. Yeah. And I meet kids eight, who are 18 years old today who don't even have a driver's license. They're not like, interested. Something yeah. They're not interested. Something has changed. And, and I you would never meet an 18 year old. And if you met an 18 year old who didn't have a driver's license, they'd have some horror story of their evil mom or evil dad or what they did wrong and couldn't get a license. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, it, and you made an interesting point, like in the future, I guess it's the large displacement engines, which 
which poli- government policy may bring in bans for and where does it lead the like a, a four liter v12 ferrari i mean there'll always be wealthy people and it'll take a long time but i wonder will there come the day when cars like that will be banned or i guess the high-end manufacturers in even indeed porsche are dabbling in it already like bringing out the electric cars but and then back to the fia and another point you made which was which i think was very true that mclaren kind of they took on Rudy and they didn't really know what they were going to do. They're kind of making it up as they go along. I think the FIA are the same. They're just trying to find, you know, okay, well, we have the technology now. We have the internet. We have streaming. Let's hire the right people. And let's, you know, we, we build the games and now esports are things. So let's do that. And at the end of the yep. day, it's trying to feed the message to get, you know, to get fan to bring back the fans and, keep this keep the thing going because even if you look at um sro which are managing the series which a set of course a competizione um uh, simulates they're bringing on a new category and they're trying to keep the thing going they have the blanc point series in europe and asia and they're like they seem to be really busy so i think they're kind of making it up as they go along sro are trying now with um with kunas in italy and and you have the McLaren shadow, <laughs> be it mobile or not, let's see. And then the FIA with the with Codemasters titles. So it's it's shifting and changing all the time, you know. But um, well, if you think about the the bang for the buck or the risk versus reward, it's mm. like all right. So if I'm FIA, I can basically what you know throw a couple million. You know, I mean, to me, you and me, sure, that's a couple million dollars. But to them, it's like okay, so they throw. I don't know how much, but let's just say they threw a couple million at Code Masters. You know, it's a two hundred thousand dollar purse, I believe, for the series. So the the, the driver cost is going to be shared. I'm I, I'm only speculating, so. I don't know what the real contracts are, but I'm guessing that Force India has to pay his guy, their guys a little something. Um, but come on, they're a bunch of sim racers. What do they really have to pay them? And then they got a $200 purse to go after. So they're going to get all their travel expenses to do the events. Um, they're going to get some, some cool events to make it worth their while because, come on, let's face it, they're just sim racers, right? So you're going to invite them to the big party on Friday night before the F1 race, whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? So a little wine them, dine them, give them a little nominal contract, put a couple hundred grand on it. That still leaves F1, like, basically 90% of that couple mil to put the production on because I've seen the stage, right? Mm. So they got that stage. It's got to go from venue to venue. It's got to pay for getting all the drivers around. So Sure, they throw a couple million at it. And to them, that's very much nothing. You know, they can do that and they control the whole thing because they're working directly with F1 2018. So there's no one who can step into a more primary position of what they're doing with it. Um, even same thing for Blanc Payne. I don't think they're quite on the same budget as Formula One. But again, you know, so they throw a million at that version. I don't know what will come because we still haven't seen what they're going to do with their eSport variation of Competizione. And I'm kind of speculating that it's kind of built to have that kind of direct affiliation. So, yes, it's, uh, I would I I'd would be, assume I, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd be disappointed if it was less than that. And, uh, you know, uh, same sort of thing. But now they kind of have a direct ownership, so to speak, in name only, really, because but. You know, with with nobody else's ability to take the limelight away from them. Uh, if it works, cool. You know, esports huge. If it works, even cooler. This could be bigger than they ever imagined. Yeah. Um, and if it totally flops, well, it wasn't too big of an investment, really. No. And it, it wouldn't be hard to walk away with. They're not going to lose fans if they walked away from it either. It's not that kind of gamble. No. Based on what they're spending, they're obviously gaining. And I remember now, actually, you remember you mentioned uh, <laughs> when I finally figured out the name, so to speak, John Hill. You met uh, Billy Strange at e- at uh, E3 when he was doing the commentating for the set of course the competizione event. Event and wasn't uh, John Hill managing the the camera for you? Wasn't it so? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and that's I, that's why I say he. Does- yeah. Everything I, I I like if I go to a race or an event, yeah. John Hill's almost always with me. Yeah, 
Yeah, he's your he's your back he's your wingman. <laughs> he is my yeah. wingman. He's absolutely. your backup man. Now, um, we'll wrap up. I don't want to keep you all day. I I say this to everybody because um, we, we could we could talk ad nauseum about Sir Amazing. Um, now you you you're running the pit stop, which is a great idea, and you the daily news, and I I watch many times because it's it's hard to keep up, and it's like the, the thing is growing. Um, I want to talk about the the pit stop and. From that, you obviously keeping abreast of what's what's popular. If you were to, in terms of sim racing titles, if you had time just to kick back and have a drive, what what would be your what would be your car and track and title of choice? Hmm. You know, I'm probably going to surprise a lot of people. I, I have two answers to that question. Um, I've also done some real life racing. Uh, you know, I don't talk about it much, but you know, just shifter karting stuff. And I've done a little bit of small open wheel driving, but not racing. Yeah. Um, I am really a competitive person, you know, and I've played sports all my life and, you know, been on various different, you know, whether it's junior high or high school teams or club soccer or cycling, which is a private, you know, one-on-one -on -one type sport. Yeah. Um, I've always been really into competition and that's another part of why I love sim racing so much. Cause I love auto racing. I love motorsport competition. So, but it's could also be described as a job at times. If you take it that seriously, like, you know, people say, do you love soccer? And I'm like, I can't stand playing soccer. I, I played soccer most of my life. I hate playing soccer. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's cause it's my job. Like it is really, I, play for keeps um it takes every ounce of everything i have and when i finish a game i have a headache for two days after maybe not two days it's like you know the rest of that day yeah um it's brutal it's intense it's nerve-wracking and i only love it upon reflection <laughs> it's like no it's miserable i'm exhausted i'm dead i'm in pain um but four hours when the headache goes away and I'm looking back on the game and thinking back at various different moments, um, it was a beautiful thing. Um, competitive side of things gets like that. Sometimes it's a little more nerve wracking than it is fun. So to meet my, for fulfill my competitive nature, I really do lean to iRacing. It's where I find my closest best battles and that has worked out i've had great races on every sim out there don't get me wrong yeah. but just on a day-to-day -day basis that's where i live but that is kind of like i again refer to almost like my competitive side job um if you're just asking me like what do i think is like one of the coolest most fun like hey if we were just gonna for you no know, just for the fun of it we were just gonna go out and play in sim racing what would you do yeah um I would probably run just about anything, preferably the Indy car though, at Long Beach and Project Cars too. Oh, it, really? To me, it's like, yeah, it's just to me, it's like one of the just a really, really good version of that experience. And I, it's my one of my home tracks. You know, there are a handful of tracks you could call my home track, but uh, I, I go to the event every year. Uh, I know every square inch of the track, not from being on it. I've never driven a lap there, but um, I know it from every being on the other side of every K wall of the whole track. Yeah. Um, and the Indy car of Project Cars 2 drives pretty well. And at that track, it's got this just the right amount of jitteriness that it drives sim esque. Um, and I've had some great fun there with friends so no it's it's one of my favorite combinations i think it's a really good driving experience if i were gonna have a trade show booth and i was just trying to promote sim racing across the board to the general public yeah like, like you know i've worked a lot of trade shows if i were gonna make a trade show booth and i was gonna have the general public driving and i wanted to make them fans of indycar or the long beach event or sim racing i would totally make that my combination oh that's interesting yeah but I, I think actually it's interesting again because it comes back to what you said earlier. Whereas the the you have esports which are massive, StarCraft and Dota and so on. But you talked about how sim racing or motorsport simulation racing re can relate directly to the real world. And no matter what title you're playing, 
you know, it can be um, R factor two or race or whatever. It's all about those of us who are interested in, in motorsport and cars and simulations in general and even um, aircraft simulations, which you mentioned as well. It's all about taking a piece of software, taking equipment and trying to experience what, what that would be like in the real world, which is what sim racing tries to do. And I think the yes. IndyCar at Long, and Long Beach is exactly what you're talking about, isn't it, John? Yes, it is. And at the same time, like I've, I've seen firsthand when you put iRacing on a simulator, for example, and let just the average Joe drive it for the first time. Almost nobody can do it. I mean, unless they're like already a sim racer or a real life racer and they know to respect corner speed, they're just going to make a mess of it. Yeah, spin um, out, yeah. Yeah, but Project Cars is just easy enough that you could let your average Joe do it. They're still going to crash it because it's enough sim. But uh, it, I I think it's that combination of, of easy to jump into mm. and quickly acclimate to. Yeah. Uh, and not maybe be held accountable to perfection like iRacing would. I mean, I can only imagine that driving an Indy car beach is actually... I'm not going to say difficult for a skilled race car driver, but that you need to be very precise about what you do. And if you do it wrong, the results are catastrophic. Um, I'm not going to say that iRacing is too hard and Project Cars is too easy, but but I, I, I do think that it's it's easy to jump into. It's very natural. There's something very natural. You don't have to learn to drive Project Cars. I do think you kind of need to learn to drive iRacing. Yeah. Indeed, I had uh, Chris Hay from the UK was on the show recently, and he talked about one of the, um, I think it was one of the old Jaguars or Aston Martins on one of the tracks in um, Project Cars 2. And he said that's his kind of go-to. And again, it comes back to the era of tracks and cars that he's interested in. And he said, he said, and I've heard it many times, that in Project Cars 2, some of the cars are right and some of the cars are wrong. But for the ones that are just about right, you can find a um, car and track combination that that kind of fits well exactly. And Sean, um, in terms of how we are right now, you're, and back to the the pit stop today's show, um, and I guess things are changing all the time. You cover the the releases across everything. You go console, and basically, you 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 take everything. Um, you know, be it Dakar or whatever, whatever title. What, what, what are you most excited about now? You, you're, I mean, you're trying to keep up with the speed, so you can have the the daily news brief, which is great. But what are you kind of you play i racing and sim racing system on a regular basis and Wreckfest and so on? But is there something that you're kind of interested in or keeping an eye on or that kind of piques your interest? Shall I say? Yeah, there there are a few things. I mean. Our industry has changed because if you look at all the current modern Sims, for the most part, it's like a, a franchise that's going to just keep evolving more than, you know, 10 years ago where you'd expect like the next version, you know, hmm. uh, uh, you know, R Factor 1, R Factor 2, R Factor 3. Well, now we're these full blown PC Sims seem to live longer lives than ever before. And, you know, DLC being the lifeblood of keeping it going and, and yeah. updates. So it's times have changed slightly where I'm not so optimistic. I don't expect an iRacing 2. Competizione, I think, is going to be really cool and excited about when it gets to its full evolution. I have no idea what the actual future of, like, will it force us to throw away a Seto Corsa because it becomes irrelevant? Mm, I don't believe so, but... Yeah, I don't, and that's the thing. It'll come down to modding. Um, which is where I was about to get to. I think the most exciting thing to me, funny enough, is R Factor 2 is starting to get some momentum that it hasn't had yet. It has. That's uh, true. It, That's it, a good point. Yeah. And it, and it kind of began begun with uh, Studio 397 becoming uh, behind them or involved in it. Mm. Um, but some of it's happening internally from the company itself, and that's going to inspire the modding community. And what made our factor one of, if not the greatest sim ever made, you, you could argue, people would argue, I'm not going to take up the argument, but you could argue our factor was the greatest sim ever made. Mm. Um, and it was the modding community that was directly responsible for that 
ability to, to even be brought up in that argument. R Factor 2 came out at a different time without like R Factor Central being involved. That was a big part of what made R Factor so great was that you had a website dedicated to the modding community. It was organized, easy to find, easy to get good content, and it's easy to tell the good from the bad content as well. Mm. And that was critical to what made it such a great sim. Um, our factor two still hasn't gotten there. And even though it came out a while ago, it's taken. And, and I think back in time, our factor was no different. Uh, I remember when our factor came out, I don't know if you remember, but they had a fake web page for all the cars that came in the game. And if you weren't paying attention or you weren't very bright, you'd actually sucker for it. Like you thought there was a new car company on planet earth and they were one of the first to use internet website to show off their cars. Cause this was before like Toyota had a very sophisticated website. Yeah. And so you're looking at these cars going, what the hell? I don't get it, but it's a game, isn't it? And it was like, it was like very, they were purposely misleading and it was very great. But way back then it just came out. I was like, okay, R factor. Here's the Houston. What's the hell is a Houston? I don't know. Um, and it wasn't until you could drive a Lamborghini or Porsche or whatever you wanted to drive that people started taking it seriously. Um, so, yeah, looking to the future, I'm really excited about some of the changes in direction going to iRacing. Uh, they've been pushed by Assetto Competizione. They've been pushed by Artifact. They've been pushed by uh, Project Cars. Um. I like that the big sims are all pushing each other right now. Um, I'm optimistic for what the future brings in terms of just the amount of people involved in sim racing. And I do give that the esports side of it credit for that. I think we're going to see a real explosion in how big sim racing is. Now, my best interest would be that the simulation side saw the biggest gains or benefits from that growth. And I don't think that's going to be the case, but I think we'll get some growth out of it as well. Um, I think it'll be more the Gran Turismo Forza F1 2018 that gets most of the attention and money and most of the traction influence. Yeah. yeah. But I think I think we'll pick up some, and I think that that's good. You brought up, you know, your Husingfeld or your Wave Italy's, your HPP, Ritmo Tech guys. I think that's good for all of them as well. Um, I'm a little optimistic that right now we've seen kind of uh, almost a weird stagnation. You know, I've always talked about how hardware pushes software, software pushes hardware. And there's a yin and yang that for most of my life as a computer gamer, I've watched. And the games get to a point where they're kind of maxed out on whatever the generation of motherboard or, or you know, chipset or graphics card, whatever. And they're waiting on that next leap. Um, and then it gets the other way where our hardware is so much better than our software. It's like, man, my computer is twice as strong as the computer that can run any game that is out there. So when are the games going to push it to the next level? Um, I think we're right at another one of those, and it's kind of been one of the longest holdout times. You know, the 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 NVIDIA generation of graphics cards that we've been on for, I don't know, seven years maybe now? I mean, I know it's gone. But I think we're finally at the point where the hardware is still, or is now getting so good that the software guys kind of need to go back to work on optimizations and taking us to like kind of the next generation of simulations. Um, I, I think they're now the ones behind. And for a long time, I had told you that they were just kind of being held back by what our computers could do. Yeah. Um, and I think anymore. that that's, mm. yeah. And I think that that's something I'm excited for. I don't know how long it'll take for the industry to like feel the need to make that adaptation. VR might be part of that push, though. Yeah, this is, that's um, something I was going to mention, yeah. I, and I think that, that VR is something that, in general, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Do you? Sorry, you Sean, know, do you use VR regularly yourself? No, no, oh. and that's the thing. I'm excited about it, but I don't. I, I don't have it either. I've used yeah. it a lot. Um, I've used it plenty, I, and I do enjoy it quite a bit. Um, 
But getting back to that competitive nature or side, I just did get to the point where I felt that I was faster in it yet. I will also say that I think it's a no brainer that if you were to even increase the resolution, even 25% over what I've used with a Vive or a Oculus, um, if you even got me 25% more performance, I think I'd be sold forever. Yeah. You know, and, and I know that at some point it will be the, the, the absolute go to the must have for sure. No doubt in my mind. Like I, I think that it's unless coming. you are just, mm. yeah, unless you're just totally motion sick person. And I think if you're totally motion sick person, you probably aren't a sim racer anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that, yeah, I think it is going to be the go to hardware. Um, it's facing resolution issues. It's facing latency issues. It's facing the clunkiness of not being fully properly integrated. So it's like, well, I, I, who wants to need a monitor still? Who wants to need to take my mask on and off just to get in or launch or do some changes? It's like, you need to be committed. Like my computer needs to commit to the VR. It's actually funny because, um, Gabriel Mossel did a video on settings for the, second version of the early access um, of a certain course of competizione and I was laughing in the comments because he was talking about editing a text file you know and uh, you had like the all singing all dancing rain and day and night transitions Unreal Engine 4 and there he was editing a text file and I thought to myself oh yeah here we go you know <laughs> yep it, it yeah. can't be like that no it had exactly and you made a very good point. And indeed, um, uh, my computer isn't a beast or anything. I'm running a Maxwell GTX 970 and I would like to invest in a 1080 at some point. And then I heard a podcast the other day and they're talking about this RTX, the latest and greatest RTX the Turing platform. They're only like a, a stopgap until they upgrade again to this um, seven nanometer chip um, fabrication. So yeah, not only are the, are the Turing RTX with the algorithm system for for rendering graphics and stuff that they say, oh no, this is only a stopgap until the next generation. So what yep. that's going to be able to do will just blow blow people's minds. And then, as you said, once there's a twenty five or thirty percent increase in the resolution, then there you have it. And you made a good point: the integration because it's the friction, and it comes back to the consoles and so on and even uh chris chris who was on the show said sometimes he likes to sit back in front of his tv and boot up his playstation and just play yep and that's where vr needs to get like when i plug that unit in it should be like plugging a controller into an xbox it's like yeah. look it doesn't it's just automatic it should just you know and we're a ways away from that i've found myself recently i've been 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 a bit busy and, and focusing on other stuff and Sometimes I'll just say, well, like I have the latest version of Competizione installed, and I just I'll boot up um, a set of Corsa, and I'll 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 start up um, LA Canyons mod from Phoenix Seventy Seven Race Department, and then I'll I'll jump into a Porsche Nine Eleven R and just drive manual and just kind of hoon around for a while, you know, and that's my form right. of kind of relaxation, if you will, you know. And it's like you were saying the the um, indie car at Long Beach, you know that for me that's and it comes back to in the future maybe the only option for driving a manual will be um will be that and the 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 nine eleven R was the limited run kind of the the car that people bought as an investment and that would be my dream to maybe drive a manual. Porsche or whatever in the hills of California and I can sit in front of my medium level PC with my media le medium level wheel and pedals <laughs> and just get a little bit of a taste of that you know and uh, sure, sure so Sean it's been wonderful chatting to you and very interesting very eye-opening and uh, and uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to join I really appreciate it do you want to uh, give some plugs on something you've coming up. You said John might be um, joining for a video in the future, or now you're doing your regular, you ha regular series, and uh, also you have Mitchie Hoyer. I had a note here to mention Mitchie, of course, 
my apologies, Mitchy. I forgot about you. Uh, Mitchy was also on the show. A very nice guy, of course. And Mitchy has been. Mitchy is a great friend of yours. So, is there anything you want to plug coming up on the um, on the channel uh, on either the Simprit or the Simprit crew in terms of content? Um, I you know the Simprit crew. If you're just looking for, you know, I think something that makes our streams different on the Simprit crew channel is not only do you have me streaming my races, but you have Mitchy Hoyer. You've got Dave Blair, you got Devin Booth, you got th- four different personalities streaming. But usually when it's a sim pit race, you're hearing the audio of the entire race room. Uh, we are amongst friends, but we take it very seriously. And sometimes mm. you hear some things that you might not hear on other streams because things get very private. So that's always good. All the live streaming stuff we do is over on the sim pit crew channel on YouTube. Yep. And then with the sim pit is where you're going to find the Monday through Friday pit stops just with the news, which I love doing it because it just keeps my, you know, I wouldn't necessarily know what's going on at Forza if I didn't do that show, but it just kind of keeps me in the loop. It it's a great idea. Me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy doing it. And then in addition to that, our edited content, which has been a little behind, I'll admit, but we just did a R seat S one, their new latest, greatest chassis mm. review, 30 minutes long or so, like 25 minutes, full detail, uh, currently working on the next level racing FGT chassis review. I've got a sim experience Aki Force review, HPP pedal review. Uh, we're gonna start trying to really catch back up and get a review going. I mean, they're hard to do. It takes a lot of work to do a review. It does, but yeah. uh, or at least the way I like to do them. You know, I like to go in great detail. But uh, uh, lots more of that coming. Uh, and I will admit we've been a little slow, so it's, it's something we're pushing for. Well, Sean, it's great what you're doing and long may it continue. And as you said, you're, you're doing it in your own way and it takes time. And I said this to, to Billy one time, Billy Strange was on the show and, and Billy agreed that I think if you weren't making content your way, you kind of wouldn't be doing it anyway. The money, of course, when it comes, it's great, but that's not the reason you're really doing it in a way. It's, just, it's the passion for the sport. It's the passion for the community. I think that's what people respect you for. Absolutely. It's the, it's the real driving force. And if you're doing it the other way around, you're never going to get what you want, number one. No, that's uh, true. But uh, uh, number two, even if you do, it, you might not enjoy what you're doing. Um, I'm doing it the way the other way around. I'm doing it from a, an enjoyment and a real building a, a community within the community type mentality. Mm. And Sean, on a final note, we heard Max in the background and my daughter is crazy <laughs> about dogs. Is Max a particular type of dog or? He's a, he's a mutt would be most accurate. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's a, we call him a Cockeranian. Yeah. Uh, we think he's like, he's a mutt. I think he's a mutt that has a strong amount of Cocker Spaniel and Pomeranian. Um. He looks like a baby golden retriever, but he's just too small. And cocker spaniels can look like golden ones also, not the hair coats. So yeah, anyway, those are the two breeds we think he is. Uh, size wise, he's twenty five pounds, so he's like a you know small medium sized dog. Um, he's got a big bark, and he's well the best dog i've ever had i'd yeah. say the best dog in the world he's not smart i'm not saying i have a smart dog <laughs> um but he's he's very loyal and very lovable lovable um and doesn't do anything that i can't tolerate as far as his bad behavior yeah. so he's your other wingman so you yeah have two. big time john is your wingman and, <laughs> and max is your wing dog <laughs> yeah Shall we call you <laughs> sean, sean thanks again for joining Thanks for having me. I had a really good time. It was a great conversation. And as soon as it's ready, let me know and it'll make uh, sim racing news. That's for sure. I'll indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks again. You're very welcome. Have a good day. This audio podcast is available on YouTube, iTunes, and Google play, or you can download and listen to an MP3 audio file from my website or add the RSS feed to your podcast player. If you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, I would appreciate a rating and a review. And on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell icon. If you enjoy an episode, a like is always welcome, as are any comments or questions you may have, which you can add in the comment section below each episode. 
Thank you. Cheers. Although, uh, if, if people don't like, they're going straight down into David Jones's locker, so they better click the like button. Is, is, that, the, is that the outro music? Do, 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 do.